Director of Admissions at BASIS Independent McLean. And on behalf of the admissions team and all of BASIS Independent McLean, we are very delighted to enter into this partnership with Amerigo to continue to bring talented students from across the globe to our campus. Um, today, we're gonna to talk a lot about our curriculum and our community and help you get a sense of our campus and our school community. Um, as I said, my name is Stephanie Constant. I've been at BASIS Independent McLean since 2017. And prior to that, I spent over 12 years in university admissions and student services, mostly at Georgetown and Johns Hopkins University. I work most closely with students who are looking at our middle and high school. And I work closely with all of our students looking at the international student program. And I'm also a BASIS mom. You can see my son Marcus in the back. He's in our ELP program, and I'm currently in the middle level of my home because it's sort of bedtime upstairs where I normally take these calls. Um, but I'm excited to join you tonight. Um, Rod, do you want to say something else before we get started? No, let's get started. Okay, then we'll get started. There we are. Perfect. So yeah. So the BASIS Independent Schools Network is a national network of schools that are ranging from age two to grade 12. We are private schools with a focus on educating students to the highest international levels. We have 10 campuses located in some of the most dynamic metropolitan areas in the United States. And we are part of the BASIS Curriculum Schools Network, which is a global network. The first BASIS campuses were opened in 1998, and the BASIS curriculum has consistently been recognized as some of the most accelerated and top sort of performing schools around the world. Um, all BASIS independent schools have a common mission, and that mission is to educate students to the highest international levels through a spiraling liberal arts curriculum that also offers advanced STEM coursework. And we benchmark this curriculum against best practices from around the world. So let's look a little bit more closely at BASIS Independent McLean specifically. So I think maybe on this one, we can go to the next one. Yeah, perfect, that one. So BASIS Independent McLean is an age two to grade 12 private school where subject expert teachers, these are teachers who are teaching the one thing they are truly passionate about, the one thing they are truly knowledgeable about, and they're bringing that energy and that passion to our classrooms every day. These subject expert teachers guide each child through the basis curriculum. As I mentioned, it's well-rounded liberal arts curriculum with advanced STEM offerings, but it's also a curriculum that encourages the development and pursuit of individual interests while also fostering like innovation and creativity, you know, and as part of the basis curriculum network, you know that each child is receiving a world-class education, one with proven results, and that we're really gonna challenge them to realize their full potential. At Basis Independent McLean, we truly believe that when students love to learn, they excel. And we seek to empower each child. We seek to encourage their curiosity, encourage their exploration, encourage their discovery as we prepare them for the next step in their educational journey, which for our high schoolers means true college readiness. So we'll dive more into the curriculum in a bit, but right now let's talk a little bit more about our location. Thank you. So the BASIS Curriculum Network opened the McLean campus in 2016. We're about approximately 12 miles from Washington, DC. The campus is located in what's commonly called Northern Virginia, and it provides really nice balance of access to a major world city with all the educational and cultural opportunities that come with being close to the embassy community and the IMF and the World Bank and the US Capitol, while also providing students the ability to live in a safe and comfortable sort of Northern Virginia neighborhood with many outdoor activities like camping and hiking and visiting waterfalls and family events. It's really a family community. So what's nice about this is you sort of get all of the comforts of a city, mostly within walking distance in Northern Virginia, 
sometimes a short drive, um, but you're also a short metro ride away from DC. And so students have access to so many learning opportunities, as well as really access to the whole sort of Eastern corridor, right? It's you can jump on the Metro to DC, you can get on an Amtrak train and check out Philadelphia and New York and places that many of our students are interested in visiting during their time at our campus. So I think the next slide will give us a little bit more about the demographics of our area. And our school is reflective. This is a diverse community that we live in and we have cultural events from all over the world. And we have that happening within our campus as well. It's, we have a huge focus here on making sure students really know what it means to be a good friend, know what it means to be a good member of a community. And so that is a big focus of our school. We celebrate cultural celebrations and holidays um, in our high schoolers. They're often bringing in um, those materials. It might be a cultural dance or a parade outside or some type of festival. And even for our young learners, the parents are coming in and sharing those opportunities with us. Um, today, we're mostly going to be focused on looking at the high school. Um, so we're currently recruiting students for our high school, which is grades 9 and above. However, we do still have a limited number of students who join us in the international program in those middle school years. So we will talk about that curriculum as well. Here you see a little bit of our building, that far sort of uh, left slide you see, that's sort of the main atrium as you're walking in. Those two middle slides are our Hawk Lounge and our theater, so a big hub of community life. Um, on the far right, you see our reading room. This is actually a space dedicated specifically for high school students if they want a quiet study space. You can also see there's a team room space if they want to work in groups. It's also where our college counselor is based. Um, so it's where in the senior year, our daily college counseling class will take place. And on the bottom right side, that's our gym. Again, another cultural hub as our students participate in volleyball, our basketball, as we compete in other local schools. Or we also have a house system. So students may play three on three soccer, three on three basketball in the gym as part of sort of more of an intramural system. So there's a lot happening on campus every day. Let's talk a little bit more about perfect, about some of the practices that really make us unique. So when I talk specifically about our high school, I really like to talk about five practices that really set basis independent McLean apart. And it really is the fact that we want students to be active participants, not spectators in their success in school and beyond. And so our high school really trains students to do just that. So let's run through those five things. The first is a rigorous and globally benchmark sort of standards of curriculum. So this advanced sort of curriculum is interdisciplinary and it really prepares students to succeed and excel at top colleges and universities around the world. We start by sort of backwards designing it. So we say, if this is where we want students to be when they leave us, how do we sort of spiral down and put students on that path to true college readiness? How do we position them for success? And how do we build the skills and content knowledge sort of step by step? We will speak more in a minute about the curriculum, but it is important to note students are required to complete six AP exams as part of the high school experience. However, here you see our average is 13 with an average test score of 4.12. So way above the national average, and way above the average number of test takers you would see in a typical sort of US-based school. The second practice I wanna talk about are our subject expert teachers and the focus we have on professionalism and autonomy. If you ask any BASIS student what they love about BASIS Independent McLean, they will tell you it's the teachers. And our teachers really strive to be exemplary. They, we start with these experts, right? So we start by focusing on expertise and these passionate professionals are bringing that expertise in every day. We then give them autonomy in the classroom. So student teachers are given the scope and sequence of the basis curriculum. So where students must be by the end of the academic year, but because we're hiring professionals and experts, we allow them to decide the path based on the students they have in the classroom. So these teachers are devoted to understanding what kind of learners they have and how they can help them master 
the content that needs to be mastered in that particular year. The third practice is a focus on research skills and methods. This is sort of, you know, one of the, I think, key differentiators because it sort of goes beyond mastery to really make sure students have the skills they need to be successful in the real world. So things like critical thinking, right? The ability to analyze a situation or a text, problem solving for themselves or for a team, asking constructive and thoughtful questions, um, research, how do you frame a problem? How do you locate sources and establish a method? How do you analyze and organize information? Um, reading, reading across disciplines, when to skim, when to read for deep content analysis, how to really understand sort of purpose and meaning. Writing, you know, all forms of writing. So how, yes, some of it may be, how do you write a one page paper? How do you outline a 15 page paper? But also how do you write a really meaningful lab report? And then this last thing is really sort of speaking. How do you present your ideas? How do you practice civil discourse? while still, how do you understand when people are misrepresenting data or trying to appeal to your emotions? How do you bring that conversation back to a fact-based place? And so I think what's interesting is this really gives students the skills that university and employers are seeking. These are what universities and employers tell us are lacking in other high school graduates. And as you see here, our students are quite successful in the college search process. And that success comes in two sort of twofold ways. One, we start college counseling in grade nine. So we are taking time to get to know these students, to understand their passions, to understand the environment that's gonna be right for them and give them what they need in that next sort of step. But also our students are so well positioned to be successful once they walk on these campuses. And that's one of the things I really love about this school. So the fourth practice I wanna talk about here is student autonomy and sort of the creativity and critical thinking that we really see. You know, building this student autonomy and self-advocacy is really core to any basis curriculum school. Students are managing the full schedule, they've got extracurriculars, you know, they need to learn how to take action to improve a skill, a grade, or to pursue a new interest, right? These are creative problem solvers. And the final practice is that this is really a vibrant learning community. And that doesn't just happen in the classroom. You know, we have community-wide events like Lunar New Year celebration and homecoming and spirit week. We have grade level specific activities. So like prom or the ninth grade class day or the senior trip. And so we also have over 50 clubs and organizations. Some of them are in the academic competition space some in the athletic competition space, some are general interest clubs, right? Students coming together to pursue an interest, um, opportunities developed by our teachers, opportunities developed by our parents, and opportunities developed by our students. So what I hope you understand today as you start to think about the students might be a good fit here at Basis Independent McLean. This is a school that is full of spirit and that is very welcoming to students. You know, I've been in admissions for a long time, I started at Georgetown and Hopkins, and one of the things I loved about that environment is one of the things I actually love about BASIS. As an admissions director, you can build a sort of a diverse classroom, right? And many students say, oh, I wanna go to an international school. I wanna be with students from all over the world. I wanna learn with everybody. But the classroom is the place where the admissions team sort of loses control of that experience. When you know you're part of a global community is when the lunchroom looks just as diverse as the classroom. And that's what happens on this campus. You see the same diversity you can see in a classroom around any lunch table. So here, I wanna be really clear. Our international students are integrated into our community in a very meaningful way. They're on homecoming court. They're starting clubs. They're part of our student ambassador program. So this is really a place where students are going to be challenged with a rigorous academic curriculum, but where they are gonna be folded into a real community. So let's flip to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about college placement because I think that's always a big question. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit. Here are some stats you can see from the class of 2021. 
Um, last week, we got a new group of alumni, the class of 2022, and 100% of the graduates in the class of 2022 were admitted to a top 25 public university, and 85% were admitted to a top 40 best national university. We saw them studying everything from aerospace engineering to anthropology and archaeology to biochemistry and political science. 90% of our graduates chose to study out of the state of Virginia, with 20% looking to go outside of the US to another country for that college experience. So our college counseling team can support those looking within the British system, the Canadian system. We have experience sort of helping students move into a variety of different places. Here from Basis Independent McLean specifically, we currently have alumni studying at MIT, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, Chicago, Duke, Brown, Columbia, Cornell, um, Virginia. We have them studying, you know, around sort of the country, and now we have them studying also sort of around the globe. And that is why Niche.com has ranked Basis Independent McLean as the number one college prep private school in Virginia, and the number two STEM high school, as well as the number two best private K through 12 program. So we are seeing great success with our curriculum as we have seen across the network. And here in Basis Independent McLean, we are starting to see our students go off to top colleges as well, and we're seeing recognition for those placements. So let's dive in more deeply to the curriculum now. Awesome, thank you. So I know the focus of this presentation isn't middle school, but some of you may have middle school age children come to you who are interested in our program. And as Raj can share, we are interested in working with those, even though the spacing there is a little bit more limited than in the high school, we definitely are we're interested in working with middle school students too. Um, in grades five and six, I wanna talk about some key sort of curriculum bits that make us unique. In grades five and six, we teach Latin in the middle school years. Um, we do this to help with the terminology they're gonna see in the sciences, as well as the root of many English words. It helps them with spelling, it helps them with vocabulary, it helps them with comprehension, as well as when they get to things like the SAT, these skills really lay that foundation. In grade five, when they take that Latin class, we pair it with a classics class. So they study four classical civilizations. Um, they also take a physical geography class and an introductory to science class. That introductory to science class is one trimester of biology, one trimester of chemistry, one trimester of physics. And that prepares them in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade to take biology, chemistry, and physics all three years. So what they do is they will go again to subject expert teachers. So Dr. Isquith has studied biology. She works specifically in the biology place. Mr. Calhoun works specifically with chemistry. And so these students are getting teachers who have mastered these subjects and are passionate about this specific science as they guide them through this program. One of the big questions I get asked is why don't you just do biology in six and chemistry in seventh and physics in eighth? And the reason we do that is, is because if we give you biology in six, we don't master it, we don't build on it. By the time we get to ninth grade, we may not remember it all. But if we give you a little bit and we slowly build on it, you're going to go to high school with all three sciences fresh. And our teachers work really hard to show the connections. So your biology teacher is telling you how it relates to what's going on in your chemistry class. And that's really key to what we try to do at BASIS. Um, a couple of other interesting bits is our math curriculum. We start to differentiate in math based in readiness. So it's not like all fifth graders take the same math. So in fifth grade, the intro sort of math level is intro to pre-algebra, but I will have some fifth graders in pre-algebra and I may even have some in algebra one geometry, algebra two geometry. It really is what level of math do you need to be challenged? One of the interesting things about our curriculum, which may not be so unique in other parts of the world, but is unique here in the US, is that we do not take a year out to teach geometry. We fold geometry into the Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 content. So students, the base level math in grade 7 is Algebra 1 geometry. 
in the base level math in grade eight is algebra two geometry. So for a student who has been at basis in the middle school, they will be at a minimum of pre-calculus by the time they get to high school. If you have high schoolers that are looking for lower level math, don't worry. We do have the ability for an incoming ninth grader to take the algebra two geometry course. So we can make that accommodation and make that work. Um, some other interesting classes we have in the middle school years in grade seven, we have a logic class. So a class on the art of thinking and structuring an argument. And then in eighth grade, we have an academic writing class. Again, we focus on everything from how do you write a one page paper to how do you write a lab report? But really, um, these classes only meet two days a week. But the idea is to really intentionally prepare students for the writing they're going to see in their college prep where we're doing college level work, right? Right into grade nine. How do we prepare them for that level of writing? And so that gives them that opportunity. Um, one other question I'll answer before I go to the next slide, because it comes up a lot, is a student who is currently in grade eight in another country wants to come to basis independent McLean and repeat grade eight. That is possible and it does happen quite frequently. We see that both in grade eight as well as in grade nine. The benefit of coming in in grade eight is that you have that opportunity to get used to the curriculum, to get used to the workload, to get used to living in the States, right? Before you go into ninth grade where that work really counts towards what colleges will look like in sort of that next step. So there are benefits to that and that is possible if your students are interested. So yeah, just let us know. And now we'll look at the high school. Great, thank you. So I have to say, having come from a university setting, the high school may be my favorite place on campus. I think for many of our staff members, it's the early learners watching the two-year-olds come in with their backpacks. But for me, watching the growth I see in a student between ninth and 12th grade, it is transformative. Seeing them go from participating in a seminar style discussion, in ninth grade, they may have it you know, once or twice a week, and you know, you'll see them sort of looking to the teacher's guide. Maybe they want to make a counterpart, but they're still sort of in that space where they're unsure if they should look directly at the person they're addressing. And then seeing an 11th grade seminar class where they're doing seminar multi days a week, the teacher is a true moderator, like you would see in a college classroom, is amazing. And I get so much energy when I go into tours and I show this part of our campus. So it, it is, it is truly sort of the work that comes through with our curriculum. So remember, our high school curriculum is designed to encourage students to think more deeply, to make connections across disciplines, analyze and debate challenging topics, and be open to hearing different perspectives. So that's a really important piece. Um, something really unique to the basis curriculum is that students are going to be exposed to AP level content beginning in grade nine. We're not going to wait till the end of high school they're gonna receive more and more exposure to this level of content throughout the high school experience. So remember at its heart, this is a true liberal arts curriculum with a STEM focus. So students are gonna receive equal challenge across all subject areas. So it really creates a sense of community because all of our teachers have teacher office hours, we have a peer tutoring program. And at some point, everyone's gonna find themselves in a space where they need to ask for help, where they need help in sort of getting to that next step. And they really do come together as a community. You know, we really work as a team. It's the faculty, it's the administration, it's the students. We're all working together to really carry our high school students forward. So I think that's something really unique to us. The other thing I want people to know is that, yes, we are an AP-based curriculum, and one of the criticisms of AP work is that we sort of just teach to the exam, right? You try to cram the material in, you don't really master it, you don't really learn it. So this is a space where BASIS takes a very unique approach. Any class you see on the slide with the word honors next to it, we are teaching college level content, but it is not sort of the full AP. So your student won't be ready to take the AP exam at the end of that class but they're being introduced to material from the AP. So we're stretching it out over a longer window. And that allows us to keep all of that hands-on learning. In our science classes, 
We have a minimum of 30% labs and it really is a minimum. I go in there two, three days a week and students are working at the lab station doing really hands-on stuff. So I think that's one of the pieces that are really unique. Let's sort of look at some different bits of the curriculum because um, there are a couple of components here I wanna point out. The first is that in ninth grade, students take two English classes, an English literature class and an English language class. The teachers work together the literature class is going to be more of that nonfiction work, that deep content analysis. The Lang class is going to be more writing and rhetoric, more, um, more, sorry, more. The literature class has more fiction work. The Lang class has more nonfiction work. And so more short read. The literature class will have more sort of take home reading because you're reading those fiction, that fiction work, those novels, while as the language class will have less homework, rarely has homework. So the teachers are working together to really manage that workload. If English is not the strongest subject and before you go into the AP work, you wanna make sure you have a really solid foundation. After completing those two classes in the 10th grade year, students can take English 10. Honor, English 10 Honors English 10 is really a repeat and refresh of what was covered in both of those classes and then they can move to the AP English requirement in the 11th grade year. So I mentioned earlier, students need six APs in order to graduate. They need one in each of the major disciplines, science, English, history, math, and two others. I also mentioned that most of our students take about 13. So let's talk about why that is. So as you can see, there are a number of courses without even looking at the electives. There are a number of courses here that have the AP designation in front of them. That class is preparing students to complete the AP exam. The first class that students take that require that have that AP designation is the AP government and politics class in grade nine. About mid-year, the teacher will sit down with students and see if they would like to sit for the AP exam in that class most of the students will say yes. And when they get that four or that five and that AP work, when they get to the next class, AP US History, they don't necessarily have to take the exam, but they feel confident, they feel ready. And so students start to take on more AP work. And as they are more successful, they take on more AP work. So, right? so it sort of becomes a cycle and because their coursework is preparing them, they're doing well on these exams they feel confident to sort of push forward. Same thing goes in our science classes. So when you see honor science, say I started my um, high school at basis and I started in the biology class. Honors biology is literally the first half of the AP textbook. Then I would go to AP biology. I would do the second half, review the first half. Our students are done with new material about four to six weeks before the AP exam. They spend that time going over that material, doing sample problems, talking about how to get maximum points, even coming in on the weekend sometimes to take full sample tests that really mimic that test taking environment. So there's a lot of focus here on making sure students feel prepared and sort of ready for what comes next. We talked a little bit about math earlier. So the minimum math level in grade nine is algebra two geometry. Um, but I have many students in higher level math. A couple of places, if you have a student who's really into math and wants to get a jump, we do have a seminar class where students can cover ABC calculus all in one year. You see here the graduation requirement is AP Calc AB. Um, but we have an AB class, we have a BC class, and then we have a class that covers it all. We also have students on campus studying linear algebra, multivariables, differential equations, and some numeracy class I can never remember the name of. So there is a lot of math here for students who are looking for that level of challenge. Um, here you see that there is a world language requirement. It's important to note that in the high school, international students, students in the international program, do not have to take a world language. So you can take a study hall during that spot. You can take another elective class if that fits into your schedule can take a world language if that's interesting to you. So it's important to note that as well. And then for the elective slot, you can see here at the bottom, we have a wide range of both AP and non-AP electives. Um, and then one of the things I think that is super interesting about our curriculum is most of my students, I would say over 95%, 
are 100% done with their degree requirements at the end of grade 11. They could technically leave and walk away with a basis diploma. And they spend the senior year working on graduating with honors or high honors. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll dive more deeply into the senior year. So here at Basis Independent McLean, we're on a trimester system across all grades. So it's important to remember that. Uh, but in the senior year, we do some really unique work. In the first two trimesters, students do three things. The first is they take capstone courses. If you think of AP courses as a broad overview, a 100 level college course, a capstone course is a deep dive into an area of interest. So this is like organic chemistry, food chemistry, the science of disease, how civilizations fall, romance and realism in 19th century France. These are the equivalent to basically a 200 level seminar style college class. So this is important because what that means is when our students are applying to colleges, all of their sort of AP work is on their transcript with grades, with test scores, and the classes they see our students taking show them that they now can go deep as well. The second thing they do in the first two trimesters of the senior year is take a daily college counseling course. This is 50 minutes every day dedicated to the college search process. You're working with the college counselor in a small group. Now, I mentioned earlier, college counseling begins in grade nine, and it sort of amps up as we go through the year. Our juniors, who will be our seniors next year, they actually, right after APs, finished a day-long boot camp where they dove more deeply to the system we use for parents and students to communicate with colleges. They got access to it in grade 10. They got learned a little bit about how to use it more deeply. They talked about teacher recommendations. They requested their teacher recommendations. They started to look at the Common App. They started to talk about different application systems, as well as heard from our most recent alumni about sort of the bumps and bruises of their experience. Um, and they started to think about both those personal statements and those optional essays that aren't so optional. So really getting that jump into the college process and then they will pick up from there after summer with that daily college counseling class. The final thing they do in those first two trimesters is prepare for their senior project. They come up with an original research question, they then seek a faculty advisor on campus. Faculty advisor will give them some guidance and sort of the scope and sort of sequence of that project. That faculty advisor will also help them find an, an external advisor and um, pair that with an internship opportunity. They then will defend their research project. And after they defend their research project, they will actually leave us in the third trimester. They will be doing sort of their lit reviews. They will be working um, on site at a university, a lab, something related to the work they're doing. And then they will come back the week of graduation and present the finding of that research, what we call the senior showcase. It truly is the capstone of their basis experience. Um, and it's sort of sad to see them here right now. These are my most recent alumni, or a few of them at least. Um, and they, they graduated last week and we wish them all the success, but you can actually follow their senior project experience. Um, there is a blog up still, if you just type in basis um, curriculum senior projects, you'll actually see the senior projects from Brooklyn, from Silicon Valley, as well as from our McLean students. And you can click on each of their projects and actually see sort of the journey they took as they blogged about it along the way. So that is our program. Oh, so wait, I'll say one more thing. <laughs> Sorry about that, Raj, I thought I was done. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of the transition to basis and how we make new members into our community feel welcomed. So one of the things we do is as students have been admitted and accepted those offer of admission, we introduce them to the Dean of Student Affairs who offers to meet with them in person if they're in the area or virtually if they have not yet arrived in the States. Um, they help them sort of work through their schedule. So what are their course sequences gonna look like for the ninth grade year and sort of a little bit of projection of how things may work out for the rest of high school. When they arrive on campus, we have a day where all of the new students 
um, in ninth grade and the few new 10th graders will get, they'll all come together and get to know each other. They'll do some team building. We'll sort of get familiar with the space and be able to ask questions. We then have a social where new and returning students mix. And over the first six weeks, our dean of the high school, Ray Wright, is going to check in with all of our new students two or three times over those first six weeks. And just check in and see how it's going. Some of it will be related to academics. How's this class? How's this, you know, how's AP US government going? But some of it will be like, who are you sitting with at lunch? Have you thought about joining a club? Do you have any clubs that you're interested in? And sort of really helping them get integrated into that community. Along the way, if students start to struggle, it's important to remember that our teachers do have office hours every week. So there's dedicated time. The students know what it is. The teachers are in their classrooms or in their lab stations ready to help. And then we also have a really strong peer tutoring program. So where maybe an 11th grader who's already mastered this material and has performed really well volunteers their time come in and work with ninth graders as they're sort of getting used to that content. So there is a ton of support. So I do want to say that we said a little bit earlier about student autonomy, and that is real. We do drive that, but we also make sure we don't sort of let these students fall, right? It's right. It's finding that balance and giving them just enough room to become independent, but making sure we still have our eye on sort of how are they doing across the board academically, social and emotionally with the transition into our community and with the transition to the states, right? How are they sort of, how are they sort of feeling overall? So we do really think about the whole child. And I think that might be my last slide. <laughs> Although I thought that earlier. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Um, thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much for the thorough presentation and introduction. Um, so I'd like to spend some time now talking about the admissions process. So some key words that we heard throughout Stephanie's presentation, community, readiness, and I think that these two words are, are very important. It is very, very important during the admissions process for us to make sure that the student is a fit academically, but also within the community, and they're ready to um, deal with the rigor that is in the curriculum and um, activities. So um, I'll walk you guys through the present, the admissions process, but first I'd like to just touch a little bit on which grades we do accept. So um, as Stephanie had mentioned, we wanted to focus today on our high school, so ninth and 10th graders, but we do accept sixth, seventh, and eighth graders as well. Um, there are some stipulations and conditions with accepting younger kids, and um, the main one is that we would not be able to provide them with a homestay option. So we are partnered with a third party homestay that we can accommodate our international students in wonderful accommodations. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time today discussing homestay, but I will leave you guys a contact at the end of the presentation if you'd like to get some more details on our homestay options. In terms of the admissions process, one of the greatest things about the partnership between Basis Independent and Amerigo is that our partners are able to utilize the same online application that they use for all of our schools. So the same exact application, you'll be able to select um, Basis Independent, and from there, you'll be taken through a very similar process to what you're used to. We do require three years of transcripts, this is once again really important just to see the student's academic history and to make sure that they are prepared uh, for the curriculum. There is a requirement for 90 and above for TOEFL and um, we do request two letters of recommendation. This is optional, but it is very, very highly recommended as it does give us more insights into the student's history and relationships with their past teachers. Once we've received a completed application, transcripts, testing scores, and um, any optional letters of recommendation, um, we will schedule an interview and entrance exam. The interview is a 45 minute interview with the head of school um, or admissions. And the goal of this interview is once again, to see that community fit and see how the student is going to fit into our environment. Um, we also will then do a proctored exam it is a lengthy exam, so it is offered throughout the um, admission cycle, 
but it does take two to two and a half hours and proctored, meaning that it is a monitored exam online. Um, but the students will be tested in math, reading, and writing. From here, the team will review all of the documents submitted. So there is no, um, if the students scored a certain score on the exam or did certain thing on the interview, they're guaranteed admission. We wanna take a look at their transcripts. We wanna take a look at their personality and how they did in the interview. We wanna take a look at, of course, their test scores and really make a holistic decision on, once again, if the student will be a fit within our community. Um, from there, we do make admissions decisions rather quickly. Um, we encourage students to apply early though, as um, you know, it is very popular and spots do fill up, um, but typically you'll receive a response within 10 days after you've completed, um, students have completed all those documents and exams. And from here, um, we'll follow a very standard process with most schools where students will make their deposit payment and enroll. Um, this is the commitment that the family is making to study in our program. Um, from here, if the family is looking for homestay placement for their student, we would begin that process. Um, some families may find their own homestay or they might already have um, relatives or be living with the student when they come to the United States. So this is not a mandatory um, requirement for them to use the homestay provider that we recommend. And then from here, the students will go through their normal visa process and um, the students will then arrive to the US and um, begin their, their school. So looking at tuition and fees, uh, the total cost for one year is 46,000. This does include insurance, the activity fees and AP exams, not included in this price, books, supplies, clubs and school lunch. Um, these prices are going to vary depending on what the school, the student is, is going to be um, participating in and enrolled in. Homestay, we do have two options. We have a um, Homestay Plus option that is $28,000 a year and a premium option that is $35,000 a year. There is a little bit differences in services between these two options, but both options are, are fantastic options where the students will really thrive and have a good environment to be living in. Um, and then, like I said before, we are going to spend a lot of time on home state today, but we will provide you guys a contact to reach out and get more information about the home stay aspect of our program. All right, um, so we'd like to take some time now to answer some questions. We're going to be utilizing the question and answer function within, um, within Zoom. So we'd like to give everybody the opportunity to uh, ask their questions and um, we'll be ready to answer them. All right, one question I received is, um, do we accept students um, mid-year or for the second or third trimester? So unfortunately, because the curriculum is AP based, we do need students to start the academic year on time. Um, what we have found over the years is that it is just too difficult, both in the middle school year where students have comprehensive exams at the end of the year, but pre-comps in February, and then in the in the high school where we're actually starting, you know, pretty advanced AP content from day one, um, students are just not well positioned to be successful if they don't start at the beginning of the year. But thank you, that's a good question. Thank you. Another question um, is: Do students have the option to be waitlisted if, let's say, they're not initially admitted um, when they apply? That's a great question as well. We typically will not waitlist students. So one of the things to know about basis independent McLean is that we're one of the newer basis independent schools. So we are not at full capacity. A fully built out school like basis Silicon Valley or basis Brooklyn has about 75 to 100 kids per grade. In the high school, our largest grade is sort of like in the high 30s. 
So there is space if this is a good fit for a student. Now, what can happen is when a student applies in like October, if there's one big area of concern, so say everything's looking great, but there's one thing that's just such a concern, um, we're just really worried the child would struggle. We can have a conversation back and forth at that time and hold the admissions decision. We wouldn't formally issue a wait list in that situation, but we would talk about sort of doing some additional study. We're happy to talk about which areas in whatever subject we're talking about or whatever sort of space we're in um, and then have the student come back maybe in February or March. And I have had students be successful in coming back in February or March, maybe doing another exam, having another family meeting, whatever sort of the thing that was concerning was. Um, and I've seen them successful in matriculating to our school and doing well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one question related to home C that I can answer. Um, so for communication about the home state program, um, the Amerigo team will work directly with our BPs and agents to send them the options. And then from there, um, you'll engage directly with the home state provider. Um, <clears throat> another question, do we accept Duolingo or IELTS? <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not. So we accept the TOEFL for those old enough to take the TOEFL. And for those, since TOEFL is age-based, for those younger, we accept the junior TOEFL. So we do have students who come in on the TOEFL junior um, instead of the regular TOEFL, but it's based on age. Um, what is the average or approximate meal cost daily at school, assuming that school lunches are provided? Yes, um, I think it's about $6 this year. Um, and it's one of those things, it's an outside catering company that comes into the school. So we have a servery. We don't actually have like a full cafeteria on campus. So we have an outside catering company. They come in. There's six options a day. There's also the option for a larger meal. So you can pay a bit extra um, if you want like a larger portion. And yeah, they have gluten-free and they have vegetarian, but you get the whole month's menu at once. And you just have to order if you want for that week by the Sunday before. So students have a lot of flexibility in the high school. Um, if COVID went in, we'd have food truck Fridays again. Um, that has not happened yet, but we're working on it. Um, but we also, students are welcome to do delivery services like Uber Eats and DoorDash, as long as they meet the driver. But um, our front desk people cannot be like collecting their food all day. They're also welcome to leave campus for lunch. And so close to campus, as I said, walking distance, there's some mom and pop shops, there's a subway, there's a large grocery store that has a pizza station and a Starbucks and stuff like that. So they really are in a safe, walkable community. Um, we do have them sign out when they leave and then sign back in just in case there was an instance like, you know, we knew to look for them or we knew sort of that they had left campus or something like that. So it's all pretty safe. And then a lot of students bring their lunch too. Um, there's a high school lounge that has a fridge and a microwave and couches and a foosball table, you know, all the things kids love. <laughs> um, another question uh, that we received is basis independent, the same system as basis charter schools in Arizona? That's a great question. So yes, yeah, so we were all part of the basis curriculum network. Basis has three types of schools. The charter schools were the first. That's where the founders, the two economists who founded the school, that's where they started. And then when they looked to go into state, so they went from Arizona to Texas, to Louisiana to DC. When they started to look for at, at states that were not charter friendly, that's when they completed the independent school network and they sort of started that system. It started with Basis Silicon Valley out in California. We now have schools in California, New York, and Virginia, as well as we're opening a school we're calling Bellevue in the Seattle area this year. We're also part of the same network as the basis international schools. So we have international schools in both China and Thailand. Um, so we are all using the same curriculum. However, um, basis independent McLean is part of the spring education group network now. But again, the curriculum teams are all centered in Arizona. Our central office teams are all centered in Arizona. And the curriculum has alignment across the network. Thank you. Great question. 
how many international students are at the school now and what um, nationalities, um, if possible, percentages? Yeah, so we have, I guess here's the important thing to remember um, about our school is that we are sort of in like a big hub, right? We've got the IMF and the World Bank. We've got members of the embassy community. For our school purposes, those students are not considered international. So if a student is on a sub visa of their parents' visa, then they are not considered international and they go through the domestic process. A student enters the ISP program when they are in need of us to issue an I-20 in order to get that F-1 visa to come and study in the States. So we only have about nine students that are technically in the ISP program right now. They are all from China. We have had other students in the program who later um, transitioned out of the international student program because perhaps they received a green card, perhaps mom has come and studied in the States and they're now on some sub visa there. Um, but we also have a really big international community. So it does not reflect. We have families from the International Development Bank. So those bring in Latin American families, the IMF. We have 27 families from around the world that are IMF families. We have about 20 families that are embassy families, um, our military families from other um, countries or background, as well as just students who have sort of dual citizenship and sort of move from two worlds. So while the ISP program number seems small right now, um, I want you to know that this is a global community and there will be many internationally minded students on campus. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, one other uh, question would be related to AP classes. So in many US high schools, um, there are restrictions um, where students are not allowed to do AP classes until grade 11 or 12. Um, I know you touched on this on your presentation, but would you be able to just give us um, just some quick data on the number of AP classes students will um, take during ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So it is set up to take, because you remember the requirement is six. So it's set up to do one in ninth, two in 10th and three in 11th. I will have some ninth graders already taking two or maybe three AP classes. So we have some AP electives. So for example, we have two computer science AP electives. We have a class called AP micro and macroeconomics where you actually take both the micro and macro. So you get two AP exams for that one class. Um, we have everything from AP studio art, to AP psychology, to AP music history, to AP stats. There's a wide range in the areas you're interested in. So, I mean, the max I think I saw this year from a student was 14. And I think every graduate, don't quote me on this. I would have to go back and check, but I think every graduate this year was an AP scholar. So, I mean, our students are not only taking these exams, they're taking them and they're doing well. So I think that's the important piece is that as we're sort of coaching students on how quickly they should progress through AP content, we are um, being intentional about where they are and making sure we're setting them up for success, right? And we don't wanna see them fall. Um, the other thing I did mention that, you know, over 95% of my students were done with all of their sort of AP coursework by the end of grade 11. If a student really wanted a course, you still could do one AP course in that senior year and still do a senior project, or you could forgo the senior project, which would mean you would not graduate with high honors, um, but you could stay and take additional AP coursework. And I did have an international student decide to do that this year. Um, he decided to stay on campus, not participate in the senior project and to do um, three AP classes instead, which is possible. Great. That's very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> they are impressive. Trust me, that's not my high school academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the total number of students that uh, you currently have enrolled? So we have 525 students in the school this year. It will be higher next year. As I said earlier, we are a growing school. And so we are sort of slowly working to the point where we would be 75 to 100 students per grade level. 
This year, the high school was slightly over 100 people, and we're already slated for next year to be over 125 people. So it is important to remember, because you pick which order you take your sciences and where you are at math and which electives you take, you really take classes 9 through 11. The seniors are sort of doing their own thing. But what that means is by sophomore year, you already know the seniors and you're taking classes with the ninth graders now. So you really do sort of operate as a whole network, especially with the health system. You know, the students, whether it's sports competitions or academic competitions or talent competitions, it provides an opportunity for students to really bond across grade levels, even if you may not have classes together. So it's small, but it doesn't seem that small. What are your average class sizes? Um, well, I guess like what would be the average class size that you're anticipating um, next year? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think the largest classes a student is going to have is going to be their history classes and their English classes. And that's because those are the classes where we're seeing the entire grade divided into two sections. So you're probably looking at somewhere between 15 and 20 students in that class. I had a BC Calc class this year that had two students and one that had like seven students, depending on sort of how it fit into the schedule and the rest of the school day. So it can get really small, um, but that's good. It gives you some individual attention. Something like the linear algebra class had about 10 students in it. So I would say you, on average, you probably in humanities, you're probably looking at 15 to 20. And then when you get to math, science, language, electives, you're probably looking at 15 or below. Okay. Um, related to that, what is the current teacher to student ratio for middle school and then for high school? So that's great. So I don't have the specific number broken out that way, just because so many of our teachers teach at both the middle and the high school, okay. because you're teaching based on expertise. You're not teaching like I'm a middle school teacher. You do get training on how to teach middle school students versus high school students. But if I teach U.S. history, I'm teaching U.S. history to the eighth graders, but I'm also teaching AP U.S. history to the 10th graders because my academic discipline is U.S. history, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the ratio in the school overall usually runs somewhere between seven to one to eight to one. But again, in the high school, you're going to see some classes with two, four, five, six people in it. They're going to be some smaller classes than that. Um, but the teaching faculty across the middle and the high school is really mixed, which is nice for those of you with students coming in the middle school years because you see those teachers and you keep building those relationships. It's not like you leave middle school behind and you don't see them again. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions related to graduation um, age requirements and caps. Is there a limit to how old the student can be at graduation? Is there a limit to how old the student can be? Yeah, like for example, um, you can't be older than 20 when you're graduating. Um, this is particularly um, important for international students who may be repeating grades um, where they might age out in certain programs. Yes, we don't have an age specific requirement. No, there's no specific age where sort of you would be ineligible. And I would say I it's not uncommon for me to even have some US students decide to repeat grades. You have to remember, even if you've gone to one of the local private schools around here or one of the local public schools, it could be that you haven't been exposed to this level of content. And this happens both in the middle and the high school. So it's not like just international students are saying, I'm going to redo grade eight or I'm going to redo grade nine. We see it locally as well. Okay. Um, once again, related to the same topic, um, in some cases, especially where the, um, the school calendar is different than the U.S. and um, they're finishing school in March, for example, okay. Um, are they allowed to repeat a grade and a half? So for example, they're a student from Korea, they're in 10th grade, and they want to come back and start with grade eight. So we haven't had that in the past. Um, I would need to speak with the head of school and we'd sort of have to work our way through the admissions committee. The goal is really to understand like where that child is in relation to the basis curriculum. And so um, if we needed a child to take a step back, that would definitely be a discussion we could have. And we could talk about with the family how that would be beneficial based on what 
kind of curriculum they're walking into. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Um, a little bit more of a um, different topic, but um, about your fencing program. Um, um, can you describe, oh, sorry, just uh, no, about the fencing program, we uh, have a professional team and coaches in the school, right? So um, can you describe your fencing program? Is it led by professional coaches? Is there um, regional state type of competitions? And are international students eligible to you know, participate in these um, programs? So yeah, so, so the easier part of that is the second part. International students are eligible to participate in our junior varsity and varsity athletic programs. Um, we had international students on our basketball team this year. Uh, tennis is the sport that's currently running, and so I don't know if there are any national students on there, but they would definitely be welcome to try out. Again, we are trying to integrate these students into the community, the school play, the art club, whatever. We want them with us. There is no place in our campus where we're like, no, not you. You're international. That is not how we operate. We want them to be in our community. We want them to be part of our, our network. So the second bit or the first bit, I guess, of that was the fencing question. So most of my students who are competitive fencers do not fence on campus. We do have a fencing club on campus. It is usually my highest level fencers sharing that sport with others, almost more like an intramural. There are a number of really strong, and this happens in a number of areas in, in sort of the Northern Virginia space. They're going to more like local fencing clubs or local squash clubs or local field hockey clubs or whatever it is where they're seeing students. It's almost, they, it's called travel sports a lot here where they are seeing higher level competition and they're able to have sort of a higher quality group surrounding them than they would if we would just sort of open something up at the high school level. So a couple of things is we do have students who are fencing champs at school. They're just not sort of fencing on the basis name, they're fencing on a club name. But the other thing is we highly encourage those students to come in and give back and coach. And so that way universities are seeing not only is the student passionate, but they're community minded and they wanna come in and share their talents with others. Um, we have two students currently in college athletics that are alumni, um, one last year who went to play tennis at a university called William and Mary here in Virginia. It's a very, um, very strong school academically, um, but he didn't play on our tennis team. He had his tennis coach at his local tennis club, but Dr. Isquith made him the assistant coach of our team. So that way he was able to sort of be part of that experience, but we also did an injury with sort of like lower level play. Um, you know, you have to be really careful with these athletes. And so I do think that's important to note is that our highest performing athletes are athletes who are most likely to participate in some type of college level athletics, do not typically play on our basis teams. Thank you. Yeah. Um, last question is, um, are the requirements for English TOEFL scores strict? They are, you know, we are bringing students in to a college level curriculum in high school. And while these teachers have been trained on how to teach this content to high school students, the amount of work they're gonna receive, the amount of seminar style and research paper writing, you know, it's just at such a high level. This really is the score students need. And even at this score, I have seen students come in and struggle because it is such an adjustment to do this level of work in the English language all day long. But I've also seen local students, right, who come in, who've spoken English their whole lives, come in and struggle. So this is high level work. And that level of English skill is really what's needed to make sure we're positioning these kids to be successful. And that's what we want. We, want, we don't want them to come here and, and fail. We want them to come here and feel like, they got this, they fit in, they can do it. Or maybe a couple bumps along the way. AP government and politics never go smoothly right away for international students. But they put in the time, the teachers put in the time and they get there, just like all my other kids, they get there. Thank you. Um, I think that was all the questions for today. 
Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And Stephanie, thank you once again for the wonderful presentation. Um, I've uh, left the contact information for Jonas Zeng, who um, will oversee our recruitment for our program. And if you have further questions, please feel free to email him. And we look forward to uh, speaking to all of you again soon. Thank you, Rush. Thank you, everybody.